let's talk about set theory. Well, this is supposed to be a class on probability theory, and the reason we need set theory is that it's going to provide us with a mathematical foundation for building up probability theory. So we'll start with the definition of a set. So a set is a collection of elements. And why don't we also define elements? So elements really can be anything that we want. Okay, so as an example, maybe I want to think about numbers. Okay, so how about a finite list of numbers? So maybe I have one, three, five, or I could have an infinite list. So maybe I, I'm not going to write this down, but one, three, five, seven, and so on. Or maybe I have an interval of real numbers. So maybe I have the interval from minus 2.32 to 1.45, and it's open on the right side, right? So there are lots of different possibilities for sets of numbers. Um, what about words? I could have uh, elements be words. So maybe I have the set C, which is win or lose, okay? And maybe something even a little bit more abstract. So maybe I have animals. So I'm going to just draw a picture of a cat and of a dog, right? So that's another kind of element, and I can build up sets of animals. And I could take any combination of these. I could have uh, stars or planets or movies or really whatever I want to think about um, as long as I specify it clearly. So a set can also be empty, right? So we're just going to call that the empty set or the null set, which I'm going to denote by this phi symbol. So it's just a zero with a slash through it, which I've drawn in purple. And the universal set, big omega, that's the set of all elements. As an example, let's say I'm interested in rolling a six-sided die. So what are the elements in that case? Just one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, the important thing to keep in mind here is that all elements is with respect to the context that I'm interested in, right? So when I was describing the six-sided die, the universal set did not include cats and dogs. That's only if I was interested in animals. So I, all elements is really in the context that we're thinking. Let's introduce a bit of notation. So x with this epsilon symbol a means x is an element of a, or x belongs to a. And if I draw a slash through that symbol, it means that x does not belong to A, or X is not an element of A. And this is a really useful um, symbol for conveying this idea in a very concise way. And we're going to use that to describe sets. So let's think about a few different ways we could describe a set, okay? And um, some of which you're probably already familiar with, that you've been using them for a long time. So one is list the elements of the set. So as an example, let's say that A is 3, 4, 5, and so on. So what are going to be the next elements in the set? Well, we could just infer that there'll be 6, 7, 8, 9, and so on. But I could have described the same set to you in words, right? So I could have given a rule in words. I could say that these are the natural numbers that are larger than 2. And that means the same thing, 3, 4, 5, and so on. But one thing you might not have seen is how to do this mathematically, right? Using some formal notation. So let's think about this. Well, we're going to need some notation for the natural numbers. That's going to be n with a line through it. So I'm going to say x from the natural numbers, and which natural numbers do I want? Those that are larger than 2, okay? So this is called set builder notation, and it contains, it usually has a variable, in this case x, and there's a universal set, here's that's the natural numbers, and there's a condition, and this colon means uh, such that. So this x greater than 2 is the condition, and colon means such that, right? So this is something we're going to be seeing um, over and over again. So the way that you would read this is you would say that you know, starting from left to right, it's that the set A are the is x from the natural numbers such that x is greater than 2. All right. And which description should I use? Well, I should just use the description method or the combination of methods, right? So I could write, say, the condition in words. So I'm going to pick the method that's the clearest for the example that I'm dealing with. So in some cases, maybe I want to do a lot of mathematical manipulations. I might use set builder notation. In some cases, I want to describe a word problem. I might give you the rule in words. In some cases, it's just easier to list a few elements so we can just see them. All right. A set is a subset of another set. So A is a subset of B with this notation of U turned on its side if all of the elements in A are also in B. Okay, let's do an example. So if A has 1 and 4 and B has 1, 2, 3, 4, then A is a subset of B. We say that A and B are equal if they're both subsets of one another, meaning that they both contain the same elements. Um, by default, we're going to say that the empty set or null set is always a subset of A for any set A. And we also know that 
any subset, any set A is a subset of the universal set, okay? Because the universal set contains everything. So how can we think about these kinds of relationships? Well, one nice way to illustrate them is with a Venn diagram. And if you haven't seen these before, they're pretty simple. So they just illustrate relationships between sets. So let's do that by uh, first drawing the, the universal set using a rectangle. Okay, and now I'm going to draw a green oval for B and a red circle for A. And let's think about what relationship is being illustrated here. Okay, so A is inside B. So A is a subset of B, right? And B is inside the universal set. So B is a subset of the universal set. And we had that for free. And A is obviously also a subset of the universal set. So I could have written this mathematically using the notation on the left, or I could have drawn it. And in some cases, one or the other will be more useful. Okay, with that in hand, so we have set builder notation, we have Venn diagram. So let's start defining some set operations using that framework. Okay, so the first thing we'll define is the union, A union B, okay, written with this U symbol. So the union of sets A and B is the set that consists of all the elements of the universal set that belong to A or belong to B. So it's all of their elements put together. So in set builder notation, A union B are the elements of the universal set such that X is an element of A or X is an element of B. Okay, that's the definition. And we can think of this as a set theory version of the logical OR operation. You've probably seen an OR operation in the context of some other class. A Venn diagram way of seeing this is I draw a bubble for A and a box for B, and if I take the union, then those merge into one big purple object, okay? And some notation that we often will end up using for this context is kind of related to the summation notation that we often see um, in calculus. So here I'm going to write the union of sets 1 through n, so ai union 1 to n. So that means a1 union a2 up to union an. Okay, so this is just a concise way of writing a union across many sets. And what it means formally is that I pick up the elements that belong to any one of these sets or more, right? So as long as you belong to one of the sets, a1, a2 up to an, then you are in the union a1 up to an. The intersection a intersect b of sets a and b is the set consisting of the elements of the universal set that belong to a and belong to b. Okay, so you have to be in both in order to be in the intersection. So A intersect B are the elements X such that X is in A and X is in B. And that is our definition. This is a set theory version of a logical AND. And if we go back to our bubble and box illustration, we take the intersection, what should we get? So let's look what overlaps between the two of these. Well, it's a ha the half circle on the right. That's the intersection. And we have the same kind of notation, so I can write the intersection from 1 to n of ai, and that's intersecting a1 with a2 up to an, and what that means are these are the elements in the universal set that belong to a1 and a2 and an simultaneously. So that's the intersection of n sets. All right, we also will define the complement. So the complement a superscript c of a set a is just the set consisting of the elements of the universal set that do not belong to A, okay? So anything that's not in A is in its complement. So A complement are the X such that X are not in A. And this is a set theory version of the logical not operation, okay? And to draw this with a Venn diagram, so we wanna take this operation, complement, to draw this with a Venn diagram, we have to be a little bit more careful than we were on the previous two slides. So I actually need to pay attention to what the universal set is. So I need the universal set in order to actually think about the complement because it's the elements in the universal set that are not in A. So in this case, I'll just draw those in green, right? And if I didn't see this universal set, I wouldn't have a sense for how big that set is or where it exists. So I need to actually visualize it. All right, one more operation um, is going to be the set difference. So A, we write that as A minus B, and it's the set that consists of the elements that belong to A and do not belong to B. So 
Unlike the other two operations, the union and the intersection, this is not a symmetric um, operation in its arguments, meaning that b minus a would be different than a minus b. Okay, because I start with the things that belong to one and take away um, the elements that belong to the other. So a minus b are the elements x in the universal set such that x is in a and x is not in b. And that's the same as a intersect b complement. Okay, how do I think about this? Well, if I take the bubble in the box and I take the set difference, then I get the other half circle. So I get a minus b. If you remember, the intersection was the half circle on the right. Okay, and just to let you know, we're not gonna use this as often as the preceding three operations. So make sure that the preceding three, you really have them down cold. And this last one, if you forget it from time to time, will remind you. So it's, it's there, but it's gonna be used a little less commonly. So let's also remind ourselves of De Morgan's laws in this context. So let's say what I wanna do is take the complement of a union. So I have A union B and I take its complement. What am I gonna get? Well, the complement is gonna propagate inside these parentheses to the individual set. So I'm gonna A complement and B complement, and it's also going to complement the union. So I'm gonna A complement intersect B complement. Okay, so it flips all of these different things. And what it means is that not in A or B means not in A, and not in B, okay? And this is something that if you just draw a Venn diagram for yourself, you'll see it, okay? Here, we're not gonna do that, we're just gonna speed right along, but you can convince yourself with a quick Venn diagram. And for more than two sets, um, we get the same thing. So I write the union from A1 up to AN, take the complement, and I get the intersection of the complements. I can do the same thing starting from the intersection, it just becomes the union of the complements. So not in A and B is not in A, or not in B. And again, for more than two sets, that's just going to be the intersection of A1 up to AN complement is the union of A1 complement up to AN complement. Okay, so recall the notation for an interval of the real line. So I can start with square brackets. So I could write AB square. And let's remind ourselves what this means. Well, these are the numbers that fall between A and B inclusive, right? So I have less than or equal to and greater than or equal to. Right, so I have a between, sorry, x between a and b, and I include a and b as the endpoints. And this is a closed interval, okay? I can also uh, leave off one of the endpoints, so I could leave off the endpoint on the right, and that translates to a strict inequality on the right, or I could leave off the endpoint on the left, so I have a strict inequality on the left, and these are called half open intervals. And finally, I could leave off both endpoints with these parentheses, and that's strict inequalities for both, and it's an open interval. Right, so this is just to remind you of this notation that you've definitely seen somewhere before. And as an example, let's kind of run through how set operations apply to intervals of the real line. Okay, so as an example, let's take um, the universal set at, from one to five inclusive. Okay, so this is the only uh, space we're gonna deal with, the numbers that fall between one and five. I wanted to uh, draw that out. So we have something to look at. So one, two, three, four, five. And I'm gonna start by thinking about A from one to three. I'm gonna draw it, okay? I'm gonna use square brackets on this drawing to indicate the endpoints are included. B is gonna be from two to four without the endpoint, so it's an open interval. So I draw parentheses and fill them in. And then C is going to be from three to five, but I'm not gonna include three, so it's half open. Okay, so let's get started. Let's try to determine the complement of A. Okay, so let's look at A. If I take the complement, it's just everything that's not in A, so it's all the stuff on the right. And if you look, that's actually equal to C. It's just uh, starting right after three and then going all the way to five, and that's equal to C. Okay, uh, what if I wanna intersect um, A and B? So let's think about that. So if I look at A and B, the points that they share start at two, but we don't include two because B doesn't include two and it goes up to three, and it includes three. So it's the half on open interval starting from two and then including three. All right, and I can draw that as well. So I draw that. And so what if I wanted to intersect A and C? Well, if I look at A and C, they don't share anything in, com in common. And in fact, I can already tell that by looking at the fact that A complement is C. So it's just the empty set, and I won't draw that. B union C. So what is B union C? Well, what are the points that, so B basically starts at two, 
goes to 4 and C starts at 3 and goes to 5. So if I take the union, I basically start at 2, not inclusive, and run all the way up to 5, inclusive. So I have 2 to 5, and I can draw that as well. And finally, let's look at uh, B complement. Okay, so I'm going to take B and take its complement. So if I look at B now, I see that the parts that are missing are on the left and the right. So I have to write this as a union. So I get 1 to 2, and I include 2 because 2 is not in B. All right, so I get 1 to 2. And then on the right, I also get 4 to 5, and I have to include 4 because 4 is not in B. So I get 4 to 5, and I can draw that. Okay, so here I go. So I get both of these things included. And so set operations are pretty um, easy to deal with. Maybe you just need to remind yourselves and play with a few examples uh, to get familiar with them again, but they're going to be a big building block going forward. So it's important to kind of internalize this uh, set of operations. Um, some other concepts we're going to need a lot. So uh, let's say I have two sets, um, A and B. I'm going to call them disjoint or mutually exclusive, usually more of the latter, if their intersection is empty. So there's nothing in the intersection. And we're going to extend this definition to a collection of sets. So if I give you a collection of sets, A1, A2, running onward, we're going to say that's mutually exclusive or also disjoint. If for any pair, AI, AJ, their intersection is empty, for any I that's not equal to J. So basically any pair that I pick, they don't overlap. Visually, what I'm going to get is that... Um, Let's, so let's let's draw a Venn diagram. So I'm going to draw a Venn diagram. I'm going to draw, let's say, a A1 and A2 and A3. And I can observe that they don't overlap. So A1, A2, A3 are mutually exclusive. So what happens if things go wrong? Let's draw some more bubbles. In this case, A1 and A2 overlap. A3 does not overlap with them. So I can see that the collection A1, A2, A3 is not mutually exclusive, even though A1 and A3 were mutually exclusive on their own and A2 and A3 are mutually exclusive on their own. I can't say that the whole collection is mutually exclusive because A1 and A2 are part of that collection and they overlap. A different concept is that a collection of sets, A1, A2, and so on, is collectively exhaustive if A1 union A2 up to, you know, however far I go, so up to An or all the way up to infinity, if that covers the universal set. So let's draw this. So here is a sample space, and I'm going to start drawing some sets. So I have A1 and A2. Notice they overlap A3 and A4. So I have these overlapping sets, but they do cover the whole sample space. So I'm going to say that A1 up to A4 are collectively exhaustive because they cover everything. Whereas here, I'm just going to draw three sets, A1 and A2 and A3. And you'll notice that they do not cover the whole space, so they're not collectively exhaustive. Okay, And we can say a collection of sets, A1, A2, and so on, is a partition if those sets are both mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. So they meet both definitions simultaneously. Here's an example of a partition. So I draw A1 and um, A2. So I missed the 2 there, but you know I'll add it in the PDF and A3. And I can say that A1, A2, A3 are a partition. And um, this is a really helpful idea and decomposition for uh, solving problems. And one special case that I'll just mention really quickly is that a set and its complement always form a partition. So if I have A and A complement, that's always a partition of the universal set. And that is it.